Okay, members, it's time for questions to the Minister for Communities. Questions 6 and 10 have been withdrawn. And I call Deborah Erskine to ask the first question. Ms Erskine. Question number one, please. Thanks very much. Since the introduction, more than 1,529 employers have signed up to provide opportunities through the Job Start Scheme. As of the 30th of September um, of this year, 64 employers in Fermanagh and Oma District Council area have submitted a Job Start funding application. Ten young people from this area have already commenced employment through the scheme. Job Start provides a financial incentive uh, to encourage employers including those in the Fermanagh and Oma District Council area, to provide job start opportunities to young people who are at risk of long-term unemployment. Opportunities are available for six months extended to nine if they meet the additional criteria. And it is intended by the end of the opportunity, job start participants will either be offered a job by the employer or have the necessary skills and experience to help them find another job or to progress into further education and training opportunities. Employers are openly encouraged to retain the participant at the end of the programme, and work coaches within the local jobs and benefit offices will support young people who participate in the scheme. When the scheme was developed, unemployment levels for young people were predicted to be significantly higher. Thankfully, the expected levels have not come to pass. Um, and therefore, I have asked officials to explore further enhancements to the scheme to encourage increased particip sorry, participation. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Could the Minister detail, and I think she has there, um, if there is any work within our department to sustain and improve the numbers of those availing of the Job Start scheme uh, in my area, given that we have some, such excellent facilities um, with the newly opened South West College facilities there in Enniskillen, um, which will further allow people to gain new skills as well? Yeah, well, I think we're trying to do all that we can. Obviously, when this uh, first came into being, this was a programme that was run in Britain and obviously then transferred over to here. We had projected, um, I suppose, job claim counts to be at 120,000 at this point. Thankfully, it hasn't. We're around 48,500, um, so we didn't get to the projected levels. That said, we have 4,942 opportunities for young people right across the board and right across the north in a variety of different sectors, um, and those employers are keen to get young people through the doors. We are going out to engage um, in terms of trying to rapidly increase the numbers, so I am looking at incentives um, to the scheme to talk to young people to see what further supports they would need to take up the opportunities, so looking at more full-time employment, childcare costs if that is an issue, and also to potentially increase the age range for those who can access the opportunities. And I think the bigger part then is how we can engage and get the word out there that these opportunities are available. So in your own area, there's obviously 64 employers who have come forward, and that's brilliant. We just need to make sure that we find the young people then that we can match into those positions. And again, if there are MLAs in the room, you know, that can go out and actually say the opportunities are here, we're more than glad to do that. And of course, we'll be working with local councils, training providers, community and voluntary sector, and with the employers themselves to get the news out there that these opportunities are here. Well, Kelly Armstrong. Mr. Speaker, um, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, I welcomed absolutely when the job starts to came came forward. But can I just ask the Minister if she too has heard complaints from businesses that the take up rate for job start opportunities has been disappointing? And when she's talked about helping to encourage those young people into positions, perhaps it's where the jobs are being advertised because, as we know, young people don't read the newspapers. Um, is there anything that she can do to help businesses who have opportunities there? Yeah, no, I think definitely. I mean, the fact that so many businesses have come forward, there are so many opportunities that are there. We're looking to see how we can enhance the scheme in terms of encouraging young people to come forward and, as I say, to make it worth their while. I know one of the concerns was the rate of pay, that it wasn't full-time employment in terms of the placement that they would have. So I'm looking at enhancements for those young people um, that want to look at that. Obviously, issues around childcare as well, in terms of parents that will come forward, and also lifting the age range as well to allow more younger people um, to come in onto that. I think as well also to make sure that we do advertise the jobs differently, looking at social media such as Instagram, where young people are 
they're not necessarily on you know the jobs and benefit offices um, internet lane you're finding them on instagram and other platforms so we are trying to go out um, in terms of looking at the new incentives like a relaunch of the scheme again um, to go out and say here's the opportunities and obviously important to work with organizations and employers on the ground to get that word out there and obviously mlas and others will play a key role in that as well Call Anya Murphy. Minister, the Job Start Scheme is a welcome initiative to support young people into employment. Are you confident that the young people on the scheme are receiving quality experience and real opportunities? Yeah, well, I've met a number of young people over the last couple of months, some of those who are working within my own department um, on a variety of different areas, and I've also met those who are working out in the private sector um, as well. And from the young people, that's a mixture of those with a disability who are on the nine-month placement and also those who are on the six-month placement. From what I've gathered from them, they have been enjoying the experience. Um, they've liked the opportunity to try maybe an area of work that they haven't thought of before. I think coming together and meeting other young people um, as well has been a good opportunity for them. And again, but what we're continuing to do is listen to the young people and if we need to make enhancements to the scheme, um, and from some of the engagements they're telling us that we do, um, particularly around the pay, around incentivisation, around childcare, um, and also around the hours of work and maybe the age brackets. So I will be coming forward soon with an announcement on those enhancements and then going out to promote that widely in the time ahead. Well, Diana McCrossan. Speaker, I now to welcome the scheme and thank the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, can you provide an outline as to how many young people in West Throne have benefited from the scheme and what will happen at the end of the process if indeed that young person uh, does not uh, end up in employment? Well, I do not have the exact figure for West, but I can get that sent to you in terms of um, the breakdown. I think in terms of after, obviously we are working with employers, there are some employment opportunities at the end of the scheme where they can then look to transfer in. I know even within my own department, uh, we're looking at that in terms of transferring them over and looking at even delivering at a point of having an interview or guaranteeing an interview for employment opportunities that arise. There's also, we're watch, or, sorry, matching them in terms of their work coaches and through the local jobs and benefits offices, looking at other employment opportunities. So from the skills that they have garnered, helping them with writing their applications with their CVs, that will allow them to look at other employment opportunities that are on the jobs um, list at the moment as well. And of course, working with um, educational colleges around pathways for further educations for those that need it. So we're trying to create a multiple um, area of pathways, but obviously the key is trying to work with employers to look at employment opportunities. Um, and that will be a focus for us in the time ahead, but the specifics will follow that up in, a, in an answer to you. Moving on, can we have the member Melissa McHugh on screen, please? Case to dog. Yeah, thank you. So just I want to thank my executive uh, colleagues for the thirty-three million pounds allocated last year to which my department added a further three millions, bringing the total support under, um, to under £36 uh, million. Pounds. For well over a year, our culture and arts venues fell uh, silent. We have not been able to enjoy the magic of live gigs, festivals, plays and many other activities that enrich our cultural lives. Funding allocated for the financial year 2020 to 2021, um, that continued to flow. We also provided much needed support for individuals, of which 3,000 people received awards um, and just under of £10 million in total. <clears throat> we also provided over 400 organisations with £18 million to eliminate the deficit and to help with the reopening and adoptions that they needed to do to ensure that they could reopen safely. I also supported our languages sector with over £3.5 million. I distributed a further £4 million to the community uh, support programme at a local level to develop local initiatives, harnessing the power of the arts and to improve people's lives for the better. In the 21-22 financial year, uh, my executive colleagues have allocated a further £13 million of support uh, for the culture, arts and languages and heritage sectors. 
I have already allocated up to £5.5 million on this to support self-employed and freelance individuals. And that was really on the back of the task force that was established earlier this year around culture, arts and heritage recovery. That was the number one issue. The task uh, force report will be launched soon or published soon. But the number one issue was the issue around freelancers. And if you remember, up until just over a month ago, a lot of these sectors um, and venues were still closed. So again, that fund was to support them. And I suppose going forward, I want to assure members um, that we will continue to work to urgently bring forward uh, further supports, particularly for organisations, and up. make further announcements shortly. Melissa McHugh, supplementary. I was uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm waiting for the the Fraga Foster. I'm very thankful for your answer as well too. And even with the relaxation, you know, of restrictions and so on, and the return to live music, could, would the minister agree, like that, the creative sector will require ongoing support? I'm not just talking here about financial support, because one of the comments that I hear continuously is that for musicians and the likes of that, that uh, they need to perform just like a mechanic needs to mechanic and a surgeon needs to surgeon. They need to perform. So there's mental health. Uh, and that type of support that is required too for those that uh, depend on that sector for their living. Yeah, no, I think from that sector, I mean, they were hard, uh, very hard, hit hard, um, and I suppose they're also trying to manage in terms of public confidence to return to many of these venues and events as well. So you're kind of trying to um, straddle both. We're going to continue to work with them. I mean, the task force carried out their piece of work. There were a lot from that sector around music who were involved in that. I also met with Music NI um, throughout that period just to get an update of the impact on individual artists and all of the support staff that go in behind that and the industry and the jobs that that supports as well. They have made a series of recommendations to me in terms of the task force. Obviously, I announced the funding package and that was the number one issue that came up as part of that task force. I'm currently looking at the recommendations and I'll be writing to them shortly in terms of what I'm going to be bringing forward by way of their recommendations and proposals. And I want to continue to work with the task force, the Arts Council, and indeed with artists um, through an organisational level and an individual artist level, um, as you rightly say, to support them in the time ahead. Because even as things begin to open, uh, there is still a struggle there and we need to continue to work with them and to support. And I think they all recognise the importance of coming together through that task force. They don't want to lose that either, and that's something that I'm keen to see go on as we develop um, a longer-term strategy. Thank you, call Stephen Dunn. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Minister for an update on providing a culture and community fund to support community halls, which was indeed an NDNA commitment? Thank you. Well, I think some of that was a, a commitment by the British government in terms of the fund, so there's no progress that I've heard yet in terms of taking that forward. Um, and again, I would urge that there's engagement with the government, the British government on that. Well, Paula Bradshaw. Your um, answer so far. Um, could you please give us an update on any work your department's doing around the sign language bill? Thank you. Yes, well, work's ongoing. It was unfortunate that within this mandate we couldn't progress the sign language bill, um, and I know that that was communicated a while ago uh, with the committee. Um, work is ongoing in terms of um, the social inclusion strategies and in terms of looking at the legislation uh, to look at the policy development around that. We're continuing to engage with the sector, and as soon as we can bring legislation forward, I'm hopeful that that will be done early in the new mandate. Daniel McCrossan. Again, thank you to the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, could you outline how your department intends to spend the remaining COVID funding uh, allocated to the arts and culture sector? Well, we're looking at that um, at the moment, and obviously that's um, contained also within the recommendations that have been coming out of the task force, which included those from the culture, arts and heritage sector. So they have made a number of recommendations to me that they see that will support the sector going forward. I'm giving consideration to those at the moment, and I will be communicating soon. Obviously, out of the £13 million, I've already allocated £5.5 million um, for that individual support fund, um, which went live, and you know, they were being processed at the moment. So once I have come forward with firm proposals, I will inform the committee, and obviously this chamber as well, and I'm hoping to do that um, soon. 
Nicole Andre Muir. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Just Park Run is a global charitable organisation which delivers events that are run by volunteers with the primary aim of helping people live healthier, happier lives. The events are free to enter and non-competitive and are generally runners and walkers who enjoy to take part in less formal settings um, than there are the more structured competitive events organised by governing bodies or sports clubs. The success of the Park Run has been remarkable globally and locally in terms of the popularity for getting people of all ages and abilities into running and walking. There are now 35 events taking place every Saturday morning, and my department recognises the great work um, that goes on through the park runs. The park run has played an important role um, in terms of COVID restrictions being lifted, and by getting large numbers of people back outdoors and into a safe environment and bringing volunteers and communities together. It has and will continue to be a positive impact on communities, and my department have engaged extensively with the organisers to assist with an early return to their events. Obviously, we'd met with, well, it was Carl had met with you last year, the member who asked the question, and also with event organisers. So that engagement is continuing with the park uh, run organisers. While government involvement in the development um, of new events would not be consistent with park run delivery model, my department are happy to look where we can assist and we have through COVID in terms of PPE packs and other supports. So we're going to continue to keep that engagement going in the time ahead. Andre Muir, supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker. And at the outset, I would declare that I am uh, the event director for Crawfordsburn Country Parkrun. Uh, I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, will the Minister agree with me that the physical and mental health benefits of Parkrun and the ability to participate in those events on a Saturday morning are immense? And following on from that, recognise there are challenges in terms of getting funding to set up new events. And uh, join with me in taking part in Parkrun on a Saturday, or feeling that, meet with myself and the organisers to see what way we can give further support. Well, I did try one once in the Armo Park, um, and then I left it after one. I think I preferred to play Komogi, but that was just me. But they are enormous, because I know one person um, I've just seen on social media recently is going to be competing his 500th park run um, by January. And he started a few years ago with no running experience at all, started on a treadmill and then went into park runs and has the tattoos to show for it. So it has a huge impact. And as I've said, all age groups, all backgrounds, all abilities can come together at these events in terms of sharing. I know that some of the obviously difficulties is that it's not a sports governing body. So in terms of the funding that I would give through Sport NI, there are certain you know, rules in terms of who can apply. But we are looking to work with Park Run because we do recognise the wider impact in terms of getting people active, looking at healthy living, in terms of improving health and wellbeing, and particularly mental health and resilience as well, and the importance that these events have for all of that. So I am keen to work with them in the time ahead. We have worked. I know Sport NI obviously are doing the support and sport to build back better uh, reboost program. So again, I would encourage the park run to go and speak with Sport NI. But myself and my officials are um, more than keen to continue to engage with them to see what further support uh, we can bring. So more than happy to do that. Well, I know the Minister is very supportive of the Park Run events, and can I ask the Minister what engagement and support has been provided during and after COVID to help the Park Run get back to normal? Yeah, well, just as I said, at the start um, of this year, three Park Runs, including two junior Park Runs, received the COVID safe PPE sports packs as part of my department's support uh, package. Also, in the financial year 18 to 19, three different Park Runs, including two junior Park Run events, benefited from the department's defibrillator program and associated training. Um, I suppose the sports packs in the defibrillator program are managed through Sport NI. So obviously I would encourage uh, the park runs to continue to engage with Sport NI. Um, going further back, the department also provided IT system support um, in terms of some of the initiatives that they were doing. And we'll continue to support them. There is the fund available through Sport NI in terms of the supporting Sport to Build Back Better programme. So notwithstanding some of the impacts in terms of that it's not a recognised sport, we're more than willing to continue to work uh, with uh, the Park Run initiative to see where we can continue to support them in the time ahead. Well, Mark Durgan. 
Yeah, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. The Minister has accepted and, and repeated the many of the benefits associated uh, with running, and I very much welcome her commitment for her department to work with organisers to see how much more they can assist. I would ask the member or the Minister sorry, if she could extend that offer perhaps to the organisers of the Walled City Marathon and the ICD and Strabane Council. Could her officials work with those organisers to see how we get that great event back up and running? Yeah, well, we will continue um, to work with Parkrun, and obviously, I mean, as I say, we met with Andrew and a couple of the organisers last year. I'm more than happy. I'm not aware of that I've received a request in terms of the marathon. Um, I obviously work with Derry and Strabane District Council on a regular basis, so more than happy to pick that specific issue up um, as part of that engagement. I call Rosemary Barton. Question four. Thank you. There is a rapidly increasing policy and regulatory focus on improving energy efficiency of dwellings as a key measure in the drive to make energy savings and reduce carbon emissions. Increasing the energy efficiency of homes is a vital way of mitigating the effects of climate change, reducing fuel poverty and improving health. Therefore, the Department is supporting sustainable and energy efficient design beyond the statutory minimum by allowing associations to claim a supplementary energy efficient multiplier for new dwellings which exceed the minimum standards currently required under the NI Building Regulations 2012. This standard is optional and the majority of new ho uh, social homes are built to these standards set by the Department of Finance under the Building Regulations and my Department's Housing Association Guide to Development. Supplementary, Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, can you, can you give advice for the, what support you're going to give for the non-new bills that are in the countryside? Yeah, well, there's a huge challenge that goes ahead in terms of carbon emissions um, that come from homes. And obviously, we have over 800,000 homes across the north. There's going to be a huge challenge in terms of retrofitting and indeed some of the homes, because of the extent of retrofitting that may be needed, um, there may be an issue around do you demolish and rebuild or do you fully retrofit those homes. Obviously, we're involved in discussions with um, DERA, with infrastructure. We're part of a, a climate action group um, across the departments because we know that each depend on the other in terms of looking at, uh, I suppose, energy efficiency within homes um, so that work is continuing at the moment. We're obviously looking at the housing supply strategy um, and some of the challenges that we we'll have there around the supply of new homes as well. I think one of the issues, I mean, this will be an issue for the executive very shortly in terms of the financing, because retrofitting properties is at a, a much larger expense and cost. And obviously then we need to look at where that money will come from. We're obviously working with our colleagues in Scotland and the south of Ireland um, and Wales as well. Um, just to really look at models of best practice and what we can do in terms of reducing carbon emissions um, and looking at the issue of fuel poverty. So, as part of those discussions, we will be bringing back uh, proposals as to what we can do within the private rented sector. For example, could there be grants and stuff given um, around that? But it is potentially at some point, I mean, I know we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago in terms of the whole house approach in looking at energy efficiency and carbon emissions and maybe not just doing a patchwork. Um, but to do that, that will need a huge financial investment. And they're part of the discussions, um, working with DERA, working with infrastructure and economy in terms of bringing forward firm proposals. Well, Cara Hunter. affordable warmth schemes uh, will focus on support for uh, energy efficiency programs and the use of renewable energy sources? Well, we're going to keep this under review. Part of the discussion is, is at the moment that if we are going to uh, reduce the carbon emissions and go for zero, then we do need a step change in terms of the programs that we're running. That said, in order to do that, that will mean an increase upfront cost and we need to find um, the money in which we're doing that. Obviously, we are already setting new targets in terms of all new um, social housing building programmes um, that housing associations deliver, is to work to make sure that they are carbon neutral, so that from this stage forward, and obviously 
feeding into the housing supply strategy, the social housing development programme, we will start to look at that, that homes are fit for purpose, not just now, but for the next 20, 30 years um, going forward as well. And obviously looking at new methods of construction as well, because that we know emissions um, in terms of the actual construction of homes um, and where you do that on site. So there are difficulties there that we need to work through. But part of that will be looking at the um, affordable warrant schemes and what we can do to change that to make sure there's a greater focus on energy efficiency. Nicole Eileen Riley. Minister, we're all very concerned at the escalating climate crisis that we are facing globally. And there is, of course, an enormous focus on that, particularly, particularly today with the Climate Conference in Scotland, which the Joint First Minister, Michelle O'Neill, and some of my Assembly and Dáil co colleagues are attending. Can the Minister ensure that new homes being built by her department will exceed the minimum standards set by the building regulations with the clear objective of delivering carbon neutral homes? I suppose my department is able to set a requirement for all new social homes to be delivered by housing associations to be carbon neutral as a condition of receiving the grant. However, in terms of doing that, as homes are built to a carbon neutral standard, the cost will be more. So obviously careful consideration will need to be given in terms of how any increase in construction costs will have an impact then on the amount of homes that we can build. So part of the discussion will be with executive ministers in terms of that as we're dealing with this issue, we know that we need to act in terms of the climate challenge and the code red alert that we've been given. But if we're going to do that in terms of building in those requirements, then that has to be matched with an increased provision around the social housing development programme. Uh, because if we do put the money in in terms of addressing the carbon challenges, that would mean less homes being built unless we get a significant capital investment. So there are some of the discussions that are ongoing at the moment. That's obviously part of the housing supply strategy as well. So we'll be able to provide more of an update. And obviously we're continuing to work with housing associations and others who are looking in terms of the standards that they're going above and beyond what the minimum standard is now because we know that the issue of fuel poverty is a huge one and that it needs to be addressed as well but that needs to be done in a way that the cost isn't put on to those people who are already struggling um, and that we need to look at solutions going forward. Question number five. Thanks. The new built social housing um, of bungalows are included in the social housing development programme on a scheme by scheme basis. Housing associations work with the housing executives regional place shaping teams to agree appropriate housing mixes to meet identified local need. As a general principle, bungalow development is not considered to be the best use of land, i.e. it's uneconomical um, when compared with other residential uses, at a time when land suitable for housing is both expensive and the supply is limited. Bungalows, therefore, um, are only included in social housing schemes in exceptional circumstances. Other me uh, measures, a uh, number of policies have been introduced to address the housing needs of older people and disabled tenants. Annual incremental targets for wheelchair accessible homes have been included in the, the social housing development programme since 2017 and 18, with a minimum requirement of new build units which are wheelchair accessible. The current target is 10 per cent from 2020 to 21. And in addition to all new built social homes that are built as lifetime home standards, ensuring that homes can be easily adopted to meet the change in needs of its tenants. Finally, since the 2004 bungalow accommodation is allocated separately from the house sales scheme, um, is a better way in terms of target and need. Very brief question and very brief answer. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just with the growth in older people, and the numbers of older people, and indeed people with disabilities, um, can the Minister explain why only one social housing bungalow has been built in Mid Ulster in five years? I think what I've said there in terms of looking, I mean, the population more broadly across the north is ageing. We're living a lot longer. There's going to be an increase in challenge in terms of the type of housing that we're going to be supplying in the time ahead. As part of the housing supply strategy that will be going out to public consultation later this year, we'll start to look at that supply chain that we're going to need um, between now and 2035. 
One of the issues is, I mean, we're trying to get to a position that meeting the needs of older people and those with underlying health conditions, that it shouldn't just be in one housing type, i.e. a bungalow, that we should be building homes um, that can then be retrofitted in terms of meeting the changing needs of the person who lives in it, to ensure that they can stay in their home and to ensure that there is a home for life. So bungalows are there in exceptional circumstances. That said, if the case is made, it can be done. It has been done in other areas as well. So more than happy to look at the specifics. Um, but again, when we're looking at the houses and trying to build more homes for the future, it's in recognition that people are going to live longer um, and that we need to look at that. But it's making sure that we're having the flexibility in the homes that we build, that people can grow old in that home and that they're not forced to move later in life. And that ends the period for a list of questions. And we now move on to topical. With 15 minutes topical question, I call Pat Catney. Yeah, good to know you. Thank you, um, uh, Minister. Could the Minister give me her assessment of the Minister for Finance's refusal to fund her bid for the universal credit uplift? Well, I think, firstly, there was no refusal by the Minister of Finance, and I think it's crass to try and make the accusation that there was. The paper that came to the executive um, in terms of I did make a bid under the October monitoring round uh, for the money to fund the loss and the uplift, which was taken away by the Tories. Um, and I think that's the first thing. I think it was good that the executive, every party on the executive supported me in writing to the British government calling for the uplift to be retained. Um, and we joined Scotland and Wales in that regard. The Minister of Finance has been very clear that he did put the proposal onto the table of the executive. He also stressed that if you were going to fund the uplift that you had to do it permanently because we shouldn't be bringing people to a cliff edge. And I completely agree and supported him in that programme. But the reality is this was a Tory cut um, which would result at the highest end of up to 200 million having to be found. The reality was when it was placed for discussion and decision at the executive table. No other ministers were forthcoming with the finance to cover those costs. So you would have had to go in and make a cut in the departments in health and education and transport. And I think all ministers, it was unanimous around that table that we can't continue um, to cover Tory cuts. We obviously need to stand up and fight. And I think the executive had been doing that. And I think it's unfortunate that people are trying to now use this to divide the consensus that has been there. Supplementary, Pat Thank you, Minister. And do you know, Minister, I wasn't a member, but as far as I was aware, those powers were handed back to, to Westminster, and I know that Sinn Féin was the party that handed them back. I thank the Minister for her answer. However, my question is going to be now for the thousands of poor people that are left without this money, who are accumulating debt, and who are now feeling the worst constraints of coming out of this pandemic and are being left behind in backroom deals done here in Stormont? I think, again, the member's just being crass, I think, in terms of some of the assertions that are being made. He will rightly know how finance has worked out in this assembly. It was the British government that withdrew the money. That's who holds the purse in terms of making these additional payments. The British government withdrew the money. And all of the parties around that executive table, SDLP, Sinn Féin, DUP, Ulster Unionists and Alliance, supported me in calling out the British government who made this cut. And I commended all of them for supporting me in doing that. We already fund or, or put money in and intervene up to 600 million a year out of our black grant goes in, in terms of trying to soften the worsening impacts of Tory austerity and cuts. And I think there was a recognition around that at table by all at the executive meeting a few weeks ago that financially we cannot continue to do that. I would have loved the money if it had been found in order to meet that need. But where does it come from? Where do you take it from? Do you take it from health? Do you take it from infrastructure? Do you take it from... Because that's, you're taking it out of other vital public services. Our focus now needs to be on a right-wing Tory government who do want to hurt the most vulnerable within our societies. And that is the same in England and Scotland and Wales. I was glad that all parties stood up with me along with the Welsh and Scottish ministers. And I think that's where the focus needs to be kept on the British government who withdrew this funding. 
Well, John Blair. You, Mr. Speaker, and can I ask the Minister, Mr. Speaker, given recent events and publicity, what action the Department is taking to ensure that morale and confidence for staff and members, um, and indeed ratepayers living within the Mid and East Antrim Borough Council area, is restored and protected? You will obviously can understand um, the concerns that have been raised, and obviously members um, from a variety of different parties um, have raised the concerns with me, and I know they've done that publicly as well. I know that there has been obviously intervention over um, recent weeks as well in terms of the police and others, um, in terms of the circumstances that are there. My powers, and I've looked at this in terms of the limit or the ability of where I can intervene, and obviously I continue to keep those options open um, where I'm able to do that. That said, councils are autonomous bodies. So my level of intervention, and I have intervened in other scenarios, so it's not a fear of intervening, but I have to make sure that where I intervene, I'm legally allowed to do so. So obviously I am keeping all of these um, recent, I suppose, uh, matters that have come to the fore under careful consideration. We continue to engage, um, and if I do need to make an intervention, and I believe it's the right thing to do, then I have no hesitation in doing that. Supplementary, John Blair. I thank the Minister for that answer. I know, I know that these are difficult uh, issues, but in light of the uh, detail given in the answer and some of the issues that I referred to in my question, can I ask f further to the original question if processes that are in place are to be reviewed um, as a result of recent events and the publicity around those events? Post-publicity is one thing. Facts and information can be another in terms of even what's out there on public forums or arenas. So obviously it's about establishing the facts. It's whether I can assess legally that I have the grounds to go in and ask for more detail. Because as I say, councils are autonomous bodies in their own right. They have their own procedures in order to deal with things, whether that's with staff, uh, whether that's with councillors themselves, um, or whether that's with um, wider issues. Now, obviously I am aware in terms of the public interest and if there was a point um, that the public interest was affected to the point um, that those who live within the borough had real concerns. So I would continue to keep that under review, but I would need the information and the facts, because saying something in the public or making an assertion is not factual when I obviously look at black and white scenarios. So I am continuing to keep it under review. My officials continue to engage with the council, um, and I suppose that's all I can say at this point on the matter. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Communities Minister for an update on the sport and physical activity strategy? Yeah, thanks very much. And firstly, sorry to see Chris that you're going to be stepping down. I think it was a shock to everybody, as I said outside, and I would say you'll be missed um, from the chamber. But good luck in your future endeavours. You probably have a better heart condition afterwards. Um, but I suppose the work is ongoing at the moment in terms of updating the strategy. We're continuing to work with Sport NI and other key partners um, in terms of the development of the sport and physical activity strategy. So I will be hopeful that we will begin out um, to launch the draft strategy shortly in the time ahead. And again, I'll update the committee and this house um, when we're ready to go live on it. Supplementary, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for those very kind words, Minister. Um, I welcome your recognition of the importance of sport and physical activity to the well-being of everyone in Northern Ireland, and would ask how you intend the success of the sport and physical activity strategy will be measured. Well, these are some of the things that we're looking at at the moment um, in terms of how broad we're going to go. I mean, I completely get the importance of sport and physical activity. Um, I played camogie when I was younger. Um, I can see the impact even over the summer of young people taking uh, part in sports and physical activity uh, schemes and programmes and the huge benefit that that has around health and wellbeing. And I suppose we've really seen that in the pandemic when those activities had to cease, the impact that that had and the outcry that that had from those who would participate and where their children participate as well. So we're continuing to engage with Sport NI um, in terms of looking at the outputs. I think we have to take into account the impact of the pandemic, and particularly around mental health and wellbeing and resilience. 
and that's some of the areas that we're looking at um, at the moment around that physical um, activity side as well. So again, once we have a conclusion on that, I'll be able to update members. I call Trevor Lund. Could I ask the Minister for an update on the steps she has taken in respect of the renewal of welfare mitigations legislation? Yeah, well, members will know that I've spoken about this. Obviously, I was at the committee um, a few weeks ago, and at that point, I had said that I had made 39 attempts um, to get the legislation onto the executive to be agreed um, and to be progressed. It's now up to 40 attempts. I tried to again get it on the executive committee two weeks ago, um, and to no avail, that didn't happen. And members will know that if it's not approved within the executive office um, for that to be put on, then it can't be discussed. I did, however, raise it under any other business, but all I could do was register my disgust that it wasn't on. The frustrating thing for me is I've tried 40 times to get this put on the table for a decision. Um, I have the legislation ready. I have the money in place. Some of the money had to be returned because it couldn't be spent. And this legislation is about been in the bedroom tax. It is about closing the loopholes for those families that are falling through the net at the moment to make sure that we do close the loopholes and they get their payments covered. Um, and it is about then continuing these mitigations going forward, obviously with a review to look to see if the mitigations are working um, and moving forward. And again, I'm ready to go out with the new review that was committed to with a new decade, new approach. I am still unhappy, and again, I'm going to call it out again, that the DUP continue to block this being placed on the executive agenda. I have again uh, put into the system that it is put on for a decision um, at this Thursday's meeting. You will know from the Speaker without speaking for him, but I mean, I've seen it in the media this week. Time's running out in terms of assembly sitting days that we have left. This is my frustration that we will come to another cliff edge the way we were in January of last year. I've had this legislation. I first came into this chamber in January as a minister. Time's up. I had legislation ready by that February, and it still hasn't moved. I call John O'Dowd. Sorry, supplementary, Trevor Lund. My apologies. I'm a long way away here. <laughs> I thank the minister for her answer so far. Uh, and I'm glad she has made it quite clear where the blockage is in this particular matter. We could ask her to outline perhaps the worst case scenario if mitigations legislation is not introduced during this term, particularly around the bedroom tax, which is mentioned, and the benefit cap. At the moment, we're making payments under the Budget Act. The Budget Act should only be moved or used in emergency crisis situations. The difficulty also that as anything happened this Assembly, Officials can't continue to renew the Budget Act. That can only be done by a minister, and the Budget Act has to be reviewed on a yearly basis. So there's a concern there. The other concern is I need the legislation and the regulations through to close the loopholes. So there are families falling through the net at the moment who are losing out hundreds of pounds each month because the loopholes have not been covered. So that's people who maybe moved a house. It was a change of circumstances, and therefore the bedroom tax mitigation they lost they would get that back again under the loopholes being closed. I'm not able to do that unless I get this legislation through. The big concern is time's running out. We do not have time. I'm already trying to fast track this through because we'll not have time to go through the normal processes. But that said, I still want the committee to still have a scrutiny rule in terms of what I'm putting forward. And what I have said, if you have an issue with what I've proposed, at least allow it onto the table of the executive to be voted on. And I have said I will respect the democratic decision of that executive, but it's not even allowed to be put on for that decision to take place. John O'Dowd. Minister, carrying on from the point Mr Lon raised, uh, has the DUP given you a, a rationale as to why they're not allowing this important piece of legislation onto the executive, and more importantly, why they're not allowing it onto the floor of this assembly? My understanding is that it's around um, end dates, that they want um, an end date of three years again. Um, what I have said was is that the bedroom tax particularly will not be resolved in three years. We're going to continually bring people to another cliff edge. I have the legislation ready to go. 
any changes in that legislation would have to go back and be redrafted again. That's more time being wasted when the money's there and the legislation's in place. I agree to a review, and I know that was one of the concerns that was raised. Um, and again, I don't know then why, even after all of this time, there has been no movement on it, and I think that needs to be asked of the DUP. Okay, we just honour a minute left, John O'Dowd. Minister, we hear much from the opposite benches about the harm the, the protocol is allegedly doing to working class unionist communities. Would the Minister agree with me that the bedroom tax is doing much more harm than the protocol ever will? This is having a huge financial impact, definitely, um, and we can see the impact of this Tory policy in England, where families are being forced to leave the home that they have lived in with their children um, for, for years. They are being forced to move hundreds of miles away. We know that our housing make up here, when you talk to NICFA and other organisations, that's why the bedroom tax was brought in as one of the key mitigations back in 2017. We know that our housing make up here cannot meet the need that if this uh, legislation is not progressed, that it will force families out onto the street, that will force them having to move miles away. But the reality is it would actually force them to be homeless because we don't have the housing composition in order to meet uh, the need. And this will affect working class families, low income families and particularly children the most, both within loyalist working class areas, yes, but also across um, the board as well. It will affect thousands right across our society. Member, time is up. Members, please take your ease for a moment or two before we move on to the next item on the order paper. Thank you.